Joseph Patterson, the jury have found you guilty of murder in the first degree. Have you anything to say before the court imposes sentence? Yeah, I got something to say. I just want to tell my friend, Mr. Stoll, that he's got something coming to him, and he's going to get it. The court will remind the prisoner the district attorney has but fulfilled the obligations of his office. It is therefore the sentence of this court that the defendant shall be put to death during the week beginning June 2nd, 1938, in the manner and place prescribed by law. You are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. Edward Hennessy, Associated Press. This letter will admit you to the execution as required by law of Joseph Patterson to state's prison the night of June 4th. Check. Okay. Okay, Hennessy, move on in. Better save some of that till you come out. Well, boys, it looks like Patterson's going to get it all right. Yep, he gets it this time. The DA sure killed the reprieve. Went to the governor himself. He's a tough hombre, all right, all right. Who, Patterson? No, stole the district attorney. Now you said it. All right, boys. This way, please. Is it true that they smoke when Don't they Don't think put... about it, Sonny. Thought of you right to the end, Mr. Stowell. Welsher, Sharpie, Welshers, they're all Welshers. You'd think life owed them something. This Patterson bumped off four himself, and how many others he's had knocked off, I couldn't even guess. But when it comes time for him to pay off, look at the squawk he makes. Well, we can check off another on the old adding machine. Eleven and eighteen months. We're making progress, Sharpie, making progress. We'll have this town lily white the first thing, you know. I wish you'd get rid of that hideous contraption. It gives me the willies. I'm not being too impertinent. Just an old Chinese custom, Sharpie. Chinese? You sound more like an Indian, if you ask me. An Indian counting scalps. My job to count scalps. It's still a life for a life, so far as I'm concerned, and will be till they rewrite those law books over there. For you, Miss Sharp. Oh, thank you, Sonny. You're welcome, Sharpie. The governor returned the record of the Patterson confession. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have seen his face when they listened to it. Patterson didn't have a chance. Through with it? Mm, I'll take it home and put it with the collection. I should think you'd have enough of them now. Don't be unkind to me this lovely morning, Sharpie. What about the mail? Oh, nothing much. Another clipping from the Tattler's column. Another one? Not a boost this time. Or maybe it is. I never can tell about those things. Read it to me. Not at all, you gossip. Not at all. The wife's boyfriend has the DA's okay. Are you suspicious, Sharpie? No. Oh, Phil's a nice youngster. And you wouldn't have me keep a lady chained up in a vault at home? Or would you? No, except that I've heard that a husband should go home once in a while. And I've also heard there's more to life than crime. <laughs> you certainly keep your ear to the ground. And I've also heard that tonight, if I'm not being too impertinent... Yes? Quick and Murphy are here. Send him in. Kirk and Murphy. They've been working on that telephone threat. Yesterday's. We traced that call, Chief. Hello, Sharpie. Came from a drugstore over on Christopher Street, but there are no guesses. A lot of Patterson's boys hang out in the joint, but you can't pin it on any of them. <coughs> it's a pay station. Everybody on the street uses it. Yeah, going all the time. Better forget it, Kirk. Probably cold now, anyway. I don't know. Patterson's boys are pretty much head up. I wouldn't worry. I figure they wanted to give me the business yesterday before I got to the governor. But it's too late now. They all want to get you, Murphy, when you first send them up. 
But prison cools them off. <laughs> There'd be no prosecutors if it didn't. Burning doesn't cool off the relatives any, Mr. Stoll. I'd keep an eye out if I were you. Addison's got no relatives. Only a kid cousin, and he's in Mexico. Thanks, boys. Thanks. Right, we'll uh, forget it. Keep moving, Charlie. Oh, Chief, you sitting in on that quiz tonight? You bet. I wouldn't miss that. Okay. Are you serious? If, if I'm you're not, not being, being too, too impertinent? How <laughs> serious about what? You're going to that quiz tonight. Of course I'm going. Yes? Oh, put her on. Mrs. Stone. Hello, darling. Yes, this is a surprise. We were just talking about you, Sharpie and I. <laughs> of course it was nice. <clears throat> Today? Yes, this is the fifth. Yes, Lucy? I should say I do know. Of course, darling, it's your birthday. You thought I'd forgotten. <laughs> I should say not. Certainly, darling, I'll be home early. We'll put on our good clothes and make a night of it. Dinner in the theater. That's right, Lucy. And, uh, and darling, there's a package on the way, but, uh, but don't open it till I get there. Absolutely. I'll be home early. Absolutely. Thanks, Sharpie, thanks. I don't know what I'd have done. Just my ear to the ground again. I tried to tell you. That gift on the way idea was an inspiration. I'd never have been forgiven. I told Traganis to send a tray down for selection. A pair of diamond clips would be nice. Small ones. I'd forgotten completely. I'm a fine husband, I am. I'll order the flowers. Orchids, don't you think? Yes, that would be fine. I'll telephone Mr. Kirk not to expect you at the quiz tonight. Yes, I suppose I'll have to miss that. Unless you plan to be in two places at once. Too bad, though. I should be in on that. Are you going home or not? Yes, oh yes, I'm going home. <laughs> don't worry, Shabby. I'm glad of that. I don't know of anybody just now who could take your place. Nine, ten, fifteen. Twenty-four left to go, Shabby. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Creola. I didn't know, Miss Stowell, if you wanted the ice melted or not. Oh, no, Creola. I think it's better this way. Thank you, ma'am. I can't believe it. She's marvelous. She's my new maid, but you should taste her biscuits. They're wonderful. I'll taste a highball if it's all right Liz? for everybody. Two fingers, please. Don't make it too weak. Hello, Mr. Stowell. Well. Why, hello, Jim. Hello. Jim, hello, you're early. Jim. Hello, Jim. How are you? Just in time for a drink. Happy birthday, darling. It is now. I didn't know, Lucy. Why'd you keep it a secret? All the old girls do, Elizabeth. How are you, Phil? Fine, Jim. Fine. Would you like a drink, darling? I'm ashamed of myself for getting. Me, a cousin, too. Thanks, darling. I'll fix my own. I almost forgot myself. And I am a husband. Hello. New glasses? Well, the set's from Phil. Isn't it lovely? Birthday present? Oh, they're just replacements for the ones I break. Hmm, so you remembered. Well, that was nice of you, Phil. Seems I saw something in the papers recently about Lucy and Phil, didn't I? Some sort of scandal. <laughs> I can't get away with the thing. I saw that. I wish it hadn't gotten the newspapers, though. Not that I care particularly, but you know, a man in my position... You're joking, aren't you? It was a triple date, Jim, and I didn't show up. The young things took pity on me. <laughs> you don't think I'm serious? You don't think I suspect Lucy, do you? <laughs> I didn't know what to think. You know, when you're talking to a district attorney. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I'm not bringing my job home with me, Elizabeth. Monster, though I'm supposed to be. Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. To Caesar's wife. Wait a minute, John. <laughs> do you know what happened to Caesar's wife? Uh-uh, something dreadful. He killed her. Deader than a doornail. Oh. <laughs> well, let's just drink to Lucy. Yeah, to Lucy, <laughs> <Thank you>, darling. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Stowell. Yes, Creola. Telephone. Who is it, Creola? Who is it? It's the gentleman who works in your office, Mr. Stowell. It's Mr. Curry. Oh. Oh, please, Jim. Oh, of course, darling, of course. What's the matter with me? Tell Mr. Kirk I'm not in. And Creola, I'm into nobody from now on. Understand? Nobody. Yes, sir. I understand. You just ain't in. I still don't believe it. Sometimes I wonder if Jim is my husband or just district attorney. How good is it at the university, Phil? 
I'm on my last postgraduate course right now, political science. Do you know after this, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go out and go to work? <laughs> he to give up watching football practice. Come on, Einstein, we've got to go. I'm going to make him study tonight or bust. Let's bust. A great big beautiful bust all over town. What do you say? Oh, you ninny, come on. Thanks, Lucy, for the game and the drink. See you soon. Bye-bye. Happy Goodbye, birthday. Then. Bye, Thank you. Good-looking pair of kids. Nice, too. I wonder if they'll ever get married. Mr. Stowell. I told the gentleman you said you wasn't in, but he didn't believe me, Mr. Stowell. He says to tell you it was important, and to tell you that the cousin from Mexico was in town. But he didn't say what cousin, Mr. Stowell. That's all right, Creole, thank you. You're welcome. What does that mean, Jim, the cousin from Mexico? Nothing, nothing at all. Kirk shouldn't bother me here with details. Well, well, we'd better go along then. We'll have to hurry if we're going to dress. There's no place to hurry to when I'm with you. Oh, darling. These clips are so lovely, Jim. You know, I really hoped for them. Uh, my girl. I bet you hoped me into them. Well, don't people say that if you hope hard enough for anything, it comes true? Only foolish people, darling. Hope's a cheat. But not a very kind one. Must you be cynical tonight? Oh, don't listen to me. Hope is fine, darling. But having is so much better. Nice, nice husband. Oh, now you make me feel uncomfortable. I've got a confession to make. The clips weren't really my idea. No, sharply thought of it. In fact, sharply thought of your birthday. Oh, Jim. <laughs> oh, it's the awful truth. <laughs> I forgot. Well, I wouldn't let it bother me. Sometimes I wonder how you manage to remember as many things as you do. And you're the only thing in the world really worth remembering. That's nicer than any prison, Jim. Except I didn't remember. But someday I will. Someday I'll stack up all the things I've forgotten in one huge celebration for you. <laughs> and will that be a day? This day, this nice small day is all right. Just having you home again like this is enough. I haven't been anywhere. I know, but it seems you're never home anymore. Never? Well, almost never. At first, I used to be able to console myself by saying, your husband's a great soldier. He must be off to his wars. But lately, it's been harder and harder making it work. I don't seem to be able to console myself that way anymore. I just want you with me, especially when it's getting dark. I suppose I'm just lonesome. Or maybe I'm afraid of ghosts. Just a minute, Lisa. <laughs> Just in case of ghosts. Jim, must you carry a gun even on our night out? It's nothing, darling. What the well-dressed man must wear. That doesn't sound like you, Jim. I know you're just trying to put my mind at ease, but you didn't used to joke about things like this. It's nothing, Lucy, I promise you. But it isn't nothing. When you scolded Liz this afternoon when she was joking about Phil and me, you said you didn't want to bring your job home with you. Now you are bringing it home with you. You really mean it, Lucy? Well, look, Jim, we can't even go out on a birthday celebration without your being armed. I'm sorry, Lucy. But it isn't as serious as you think. The gun has made everything sort of melodramatic. But I didn't realize that I was bringing the job home with me. Sharpie accused me of it, but I wouldn't listen. I've been wrong. I stand convicted. Pardon me, Governor, and I promise it won't happen again. But it isn't just the gun, Jim. I know, darling. It's me. It's the job. <laughs> it's everything about me. Yes, Crayola? These yes count. Orchids. Oh, this is my birthday. Jim, you're a darling. You're a considerate, impeccable husband. And I'm ashamed of myself for saying the things I did a few minutes ago. No, I'm caught again. Caught? Sharpie thought of the flowers, too. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, anyway, this is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to think of something original before the evening's over. Now. Nice evening, ma'am. Perfect, Jinx. Perfect. It's been some time, Jinx, since we've made an evening of it. But Mrs. Stowell with us, it is, sir. Why, Jinx, you mean? Oh, no, ma'am. I didn't mean that. <laughs>
about giving a dead man a break? And let it show on the front pages. <laughs> You're marvelous, Jim. You couldn't have done it better if you'd planned it. It's a great break. And all for a nick in the elbow. That's luck, man. And you deserve it. I'd like to have quizzed that kid before he died. Cigarette? I never use them. No, Jim. It's better the way it happens. It's a closed book. We've had enough Patterson. I'd like to have had those newspaper boys in here last night when they were operating. You look good and sick. The doc wouldn't stand for it. We'd have had a great break in the morning papers. Well, the afternoon papers are not to be sneezed at in this town. No, sir. If this were election year, we could snap you right into City Hall. Easy. Just like that. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for nothing. I'm doing you no favors I'm not doing myself. Well, you've got this town by the ear. Sir, by its long, hairy ear. <laughs> You're a hero. That's what you are. <laughs> Well, goodbye, Jim. I'll be in later with the papers. All right. See you later. We've all gone, darling. Enjoy your walk. Why, yes, Jim. While I was walking, I did a lot of thinking. An awful lot, Jim. Bad for your complexion, darling. I heard those reporters talking coming out of the elevator. I couldn't believe they were talking about you. I overheard one of them say the Inquisitor almost got it himself. Don't you think, Jim, that when things like this can happen, when people try to kill you in front of your own house, don't you think it's high time one of us started thinking? I've been thinking myself, Lizzie. Quite a lot, too. But I mean about us, Jim. We've got to do something. I've hardly ever seen you as bad enough, but when... I know. I've become a regular headhunter, as Sharpie says. The Sharpie say that? All the time. It says I've become a maniac. It says everybody's a suspect with me. Everybody's a potential criminal. It says all I live for is convictions and executions. I never had the nerve to tell you. You didn't have to tell me. I knew it. You what you were thinking, too. Did you really? <laughs> really and truly. Yes? Who is it? Oh. It's Mr. Kirk. Do you want to talk? Yes, Yes, Kirk. Fine, fine. No, no, I'll tell you what to do. You handle the office yourself. That's right. No, no, it isn't that. I'm fine. Perfect. No, Mrs. Stoll and I are going away on a trip. Three or four weeks. <laughs> we haven't worked it out yet. Maybe Canada, maybe California, maybe Europe. I've never had a vacation, and there's no telling where we'll end up. Thanks, Kirk. Thanks. <laughs> Goodbye. Do you really mean that? Absolutely. We both need a vacation, Lizzie. We both need to renew our old acquaintanceship. Oh, Jim. Yeah? You know, that trip we've been saving up for our old age? Or the one we were going to take for a honeymoon and dinner? <laughs> or any of those trips we should have taken and never did. All right, darling? I can't believe it, Jim. I really can't. Will you start believing right now? Land of the Midnight Sun. Arabia. Blue Mediterranean. An old Quebec. Australia. The Riviera. Where would you like to go, Liz? Cairo looks pretty good to me. Why not two weeks of salmon fishing in Alaska? I think I'd like to go to Switzerland. Very aloof, Switzerland. But it's so clean and quiet. Egypt's where I want to go. Dark and mysterious. Oh, no, no. Egypt's got no sense of humor. I don't want anything dark. I want sunshine and snow and everything white and blue and glistening. Listen to me, will you? I'll be happy if we ever get anywhere. I still have to pinch myself to make sure I'm awake, and I'm very careful not to pinch too hard. I really can't believe it. I really can't believe it. A bracelet to match the lady's birthday clips. Your clips, Sharpie. How oh, they've been gnawing at my conscience. <laughs> I had to think of something myself, or I wouldn't have enjoyed a moment of the trip. So you're really going? I have to, Sharpie. I have to. I haven't been myself lately. I've been somebody else. You're not telling me anything. I haven't got so lately. I'm suspicious of everybody. <laughs> well, I'm suspicious of you, Sharpie. I'm even suspicious of myself. I third degree myself. I put myself on the stand. I find myself turning around quickly to see if I'm the man I think I am. What did you say to that, Sharpie? I'd say you weren't going away a moment too soon. All right, Sharpie. You're always right, so I'm going. The moment I go out of this office, I'm gone, you understand? And you don't know where to find me. Yes, Mr. Kirk. No, Mr. Kirk, he's not in the office. I see. A murder. But I'm not... I imagine it must be sensational. Of course. I know. Yes, Mr. Kirk. If you should come in, I'll have him call you immediately. Goodbye. And don't call me Sharpie. The sins you have on your soul, Sharpie. I'd run if I were you. No, I'm running. Thanks, Sharpie. Goodbye. Thanks. I didn't think you had that much sense. 
if, if I'm not being, being too, too impertinent. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Stowell's not in the office, and I don't know where to find him. Oh, it's the police headquarters. I'm sure it must be very important, but I have no idea where to find him. So sorry. So very sorry. <laughs> Goodbye. Sorry, he's not here, Captain. Oh, the McAllen murder. Hmm. That is important. Uh, but uh, I don't know where to reach him. You see, Mr. Stowell's gone away on a vacation. I'm so sorry. So very sorry. Goodbye. Hello, Sharpie. Where's the chief? I haven't the faintest idea. Well, I've got to get a hold of him. Dr. Sean McAllen just shot his wife. Oh, indeed. Scoop Kirk. Well, it's the biggest thing that's broken around here in years. You know him, Sharpie, the Pittsburgh McAllens. Millionaires. He teaches up at the university. I'm sorry, Mr. Kirk, but Mr. Stowell is away on a vacation. Well, he can't have gone very far. He was here half hour ago. I know, but he was moving mighty fast. Yes, Lieutenant, what can I do for you? I wondered if you had located Mr. Stowell yet. He's gone. Sharpie says he's gone on a vacation. Oh, that's too bad. They're bringing McAllen over here. I figured Jim would want to question him. He won't open his mouth. Well, I'll question him. What did you pick up, Fred? Oh, the same old story. He was crazy about her and found her with another man. You know, I remember something about her. Didn't his family kick him out when he married her? Without a cent. Come on, come on. I think I'll be going now, if you gentlemen don't mind. See if you can locate the chief. Now, Mr. McAllen, spill it! Lock up when they're all through, Pinky. And put the cat out. Okay, Sharpie. Nothing, Dr. McAllen. But you shot well enough to kill. A precise, deadly shot, Dr. McAllen. Are you sure you don't remember that? Your silence has no point, Dr. McAllen. When you shot to kill, when your gun spoke, you spoke. It's too late now for silence, Dr. McAllen. You're an educated man. You know men have been shooting faithless wives since time began. No, no, Mr. Kirk. Just a moment, if you please. Gentlemen, if you'll be kind enough, I'd like to be alone with Dr. McAllen for a moment. I can imagine the strain he's been under. Would you be kind enough to leave us alone for a moment? Okay, Chief. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dr. McAllen. We've been so inconsiderate. Sometimes my men allow their ambitions to run away with them. You better sit down, honey, and rest your feet. I caught myself doing that once unaware, and I was wore out for a whole week. Now, that's bad. You may not never get over it. It'll do you good to get the whole thing off your chest. There's no use of talking, Mr. Stoll. There's no use of anything now. Do you like cigarettes? I don't want you to talk if you don't feel like it. I just want you to know we're not monsters here. We're just human beings like yourself. They can do what they want with me. It doesn't matter anymore. Nobody's going to do anything to you, Dr. McAllen. I'm not trying to hide anything. I shot my wife. I killed her. Are you 
sure you wouldn't like a drink? I suppose it all happened suddenly. Only this afternoon, only a few hours ago, I was leaving home for class. When I realized it was raining, I went back for my raincoat. It was then I saw her. Saw her sitting in her room before the mirror. Never had she seemed so beautiful. Sitting there in the dark, with only the two small lights on her dressing table burning. Powdering her neck and shoulders, smiling and humming, happy with herself. Never had she seemed so beautiful as at that moment. With a mirror light shining up on her face. And the rain beating on the window behind her. All husbands have moments like that. And at that moment, I realized how terribly I'd neglected her. Oh, I know it sounds horrible now, but it was for her sake I neglected her. For her sake, I worked, studied. I wanted her to have good things. And we were poor, very poor. I understand. You watched your wife before the mirror. And as I watched her, I said to myself, I would never neglect her again. And then I... Then I tiptoed across the room to the dressing table. With her humming, she didn't hear me. I leaned down quickly and kissed her. Instantly, the moment I kissed her, she shivered. Her flesh became goose-pimply as with cold. I saw her face in the mirror looking up at me, and all this happiness was gone. And on it was a look of revulsion. I was speechless, stunned. I see, I see. The Japanese have an expression. A woman tells the truth to her mirror. And then she recovered and looked up at me and laughed and said, you should know better than to ruin a lady's makeup. She began to powder the spot on her neck where I'd kissed her. And she got to her feet and, and kissed me on the cheek. I've got to run along, she said. I'm playing bridge at Sonia's. I'll see you for dinner. She ran out. I stood. Still speechless. And watched her go. I see. And that was how it began. My brain was on fire. I was sure there was only one explanation. She was making herself beautiful for some man. And she was going to him. She wasn't going to Sonia's. I followed her in the rain. And what finally happened, Dr. McAllen? I killed her. I know, but the circumstances. It's all unreal to me. All blood. I was blind, insane. I saw her enter the house. I went to a window. I saw her run into a man's arms. The fire in my brain became a fury. I didn't realize I'd drawn the gun. I didn't realize I'd fired it. Until I saw her body crumble to the floor. And then I knew I'd killed her. In that instant, I knew I'd lost forever the one thing in the world I loved. It's my fault. My stupidity. My neglect. Kirk, better get him out of here. Well, it's as if you'll have to give him a lift. Come on, let's keep going. Better have the doctor give him a shot or something. A sleep will do him good. Did you get it recorded? Yes, sir. Every word of it. It's right there. We've got a written transcription, too. We'll send him to the chair. Did you ever hear such a fairy tale in your life? <laughs> the kiss before the mirror. I don't know, Chief. You know, that's the way things like that sometimes start. Oh, you should be smarter, Kirk. His emotional upset fools you. Well, that was genuine enough. But the kiss before the mirror story, <laughs> that's something else again. Wait till a jury hears it, with the proper commentary by the prosecution, I mean. You want to transfer to Sylvan? No, 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 no. I like it flat. I can play the whole thing through then. I think I'll take it home and lock it up. Keep this quiet. The McAllen family will probably leap to the rescue with their millions now the wife is out of the way. And by tomorrow, they'll have all the legal brains in the country lined up against us. They'll repudiate the confession. Well, they'll repudiate it, all right. But if we don't mention it, they won't worry about it. That is, until we spring it. And I have an idea something can be made of it at the right time. It's going to be a battle. I won't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you uh, wanted this. <laughs> oh, that's something else. 
I forgot this earlier. <laughs> my message, darling? Yes, I got it, Jim. I'm sorry, terribly sorry, but I couldn't pass it up, Lucy. Yes, I imagine it'll be a sensational case, another conviction. Oh, it isn't that. I'd be shirking my job if I went away now, believe me. <laughs> That's funny, to kiss before the mirror. What's funny? Nothing. Nothing for your pretty ears. I was just reminded of a little story I heard today. to defend McGallan. Famous criminal lawyer engages family rallies to professor's aid. So they've hired Dave Morrow. The McGallan millions begin to talk. Believe me, they'll have to talk pretty loud. Well, he's down the street this noon are saying he'll buy his way out. You know, I'd like to see someone try it. This is one case I'm going through with to the limit. I can understand some bohunk full of booze on a Saturday night cracking another mug skull over a crap game. But these polite, sensitive murderers, these sophisticates like McGowan deserve no quarter. And they'll get none from me. Imagine a responsible, intelligent, educated man killing another man. Oh, I've known a lot of men I like killed. Oh, I'm serious, Dan. You wouldn't do it, I wouldn't do it. And the last thing either of us would ever think of doing is killing a woman. Crimes of passion, psychologists call them. Crimes of decadence, I call them. Luxuries, indulgences. Yes? Kirk is here. Send him in. Well, Jim, I've got to run. One thing is certain anyhow. This time you've got the people back of you. Up to now, you've been picking on the rank and file, those mugs and bohunks you mentioned, the masses. Now, you've bagged a, a highbrow, a millionaire, and it'll do you a lot of good, Jim. An awful lot of good. Hello, Eddie. Well, how do you do, sir? Come on in. I'm on the way out. Goodbye, Jim, and uh, good luck. See you later. Huh? Goodbye, sir. Well, he had a permit for the gun, all right. Seems he used to walk back and forth to his classes, and there have been a lot of holdups along through there after dark, and he got the gun for protection. But I don't know what a guy like that would do with a gun if someone held him up. <laughs> he could use a gun, all right. That's the late Mrs. McGallum. Any news of the other man? Vanished completely. Not a sign or a trace of him. He was just a lodger there. Suppose McGallum knew this man. Suppose the whole thing was framed. And I don't believe McGallum could frame anything. I've had a rule all my life, Kirk. Never take any human being for granted. Just think what getting rid of his wife would mean. His family's forgiveness. Return to the security of millions. A chance to follow his studies and comfort. What is he professor of, anyway? Political science. Oh, yes, I remember. See what an opportunity this man would offer? It's true, he neglected her. He said so himself. And why didn't he kill the man? That's what a man usually does. Kills both of them. But not a professor of political science. Hmm. I was just telling Dan Ellison. McGowan's one of those sensitive murderers. Consider that fancy tale of his. The kiss before the mirror. It's raining out. He comes back for his raincoat. Sees his wife. Kisses her. She laughs at him. Suddenly he sees red. My brain was on fire. I was sure there was only one explanation. She was making herself beautiful for some man. And she was going to him. She wasn't going to Sonia's. I followed her in the rain. And what finally happened, Dr. McGowan? I killed her. I know, but the circumstances. It's all unreal to me. All blood. I was blind, insane. I saw her enter the house. I went to a window. I saw her run into a man's arms. The fire in my brain became a fury. I didn't realize I'd drawn the gun. I didn't realize I'd fired it. Until I saw her body crumble to the floor. 
And then I knew I'd killed her. In that instant, I knew I'd lost forever the one thing in the world I loved. It's my fault. My stupidity. Oh, hello, Phil. Hello, Lucy. Say, what's the matter with you? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. A ghost? Well, maybe not a ghost, but a boogeyman, anyway. Oh, no, I've just been sort of moping around. No fooling now. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. Just these early summer evenings, I suppose. I'm afraid I'm a little weepy every now and then, Phil. I'm also afraid I enjoy it. Well, in the first place, you shouldn't sit in the dark. And don't give me that sad business about these early summer evenings. Your trip's been called off. That's it, isn't it? That's it. Sit down, Phil. I know. It's a tough break all the way around. You know, Lucy, Dr. McAllen was my prof in political science at the university. He was a great little man. I imagine he was. He was like a child. So lovable and simple. Everybody at the university knew about his wife except him. I wonder how he came to find it out. Let's go out on the terrace. It's so close in here. Fresh air is better. Are you sure you feel all right? Oh, yes, I'm all right. Well, it was Dr. McGallan I came over to talk about, but perhaps I'd better let it go. You seem to have enough bother. Oh, go ahead, Phil. I'm fine now. Well, Lucy, it's just that I'd like to see the poor gent get some sort of a break. I guess there's no doubt he shot her, but, well, I thought if, if Jim knew what a terrible woman she was and what a sweet little man he is, it might help. He might be lenient anyway. And I thought if, if you could... If I could speak to Jim? Yes, Lucy, if you could. Because I could never do it. It'd be a waste of time, Phil. Well, I thought knowing Dr. McAllen... And... I know. But there's nothing you can do, nor we can do. When Jim gets on a case like this, he's different. He's a stranger. This job becomes a mania with him. I don't know him. I, I don't understand him. I'm even afraid of him. Well, I'm really sorry I mentioned this. Oh, I guess it isn't as bad as it sounds, Phil. Jim's always thoughtful and gracious with me. It's just that other side of it. I understand perfectly. That's a tough racket he's in. I'm sorry I bothered you. Yeah, I wish I could be of help. Well, I wish I could be of some help to you, Lucy. And when Jim is off on one of those cases, you know, I mean, whenever you need some laughs, why, give me a ring, will you? Oh, thanks, Phil. Whenever I feel like I need some laughs, I'll do that. Well, How's Liz? Oh, fine, fine. But she's ambitious as the devil. She wants me to get a job right now. How disgusting. It's terrible. She wants me to give up my boyhood. <laughs> well, I've got to go. Good night, Phil. Good night, Lizzie. Oh, I didn't know you were here, Jim. How long have you been home? Just a few minutes. Out for a walk? No, Phil's up there, but we've been out on the terrace talking. Phil likes the dark, too. Writing poetry, I suppose. Oh, no. Phil's one of our young realists. He lives a sort of poetry, though. Limericks, I imagine. No, popular songs. Gay ones, bright ones. How's Elizabeth? Oh, she's fine. Phil says she's ambitious as the devil. She wants him to give up his boyhood. He couldn't mean his childhood, could he? What's the matter with you, Jim? Huh. Why? Talking like that. You like Phil, don't you? You always have. Oh, of course I like Phil. It's just my evil nature, darling. I was so disappointed not to find you here. I'm afraid I'm old-fashioned. I want my woman in the house when I come home. What's got into you, Jim? I was here. Yes, I know. I guess it was just when I found you here with Phil, I was... You don't mean jealous, do you? No, not jealous. Envious. I envied him. I envy anybody who has a single moment of your time. I envy them your eyes, your voice, your presence. I even envy them your shadow. Do you know the other morning when you told me of some wild dream you had that night? How you'd gone to a masquerade and I wasn't there? Do you know I was furious? Furious because I wasn't there in your dream? Furious with all the people who were? I didn't say anything about it, but it wasn't until I got to the office that I was myself again. Top is right, Jim. You are going crazy. With worship of your darling.
How about they had some idea like that? More coffee? Why quite? No, darling. Bribery. Using the family millions on me. I'm sure they know you better than that. Well, they're spending plenty as it is. You want another walk with Mr. Stolwell? No, thanks. You, Mr. Stolwell? If I eat another walk with Creole, I'd turn into one. You eat them. Oh, I can't. I'll die. A walk or two won't make any difference. Oh, I ain't dying for my figure. I was dying for my mind. The doctor said if I didn't eat no more starch, it would take the fat off my head and I'd improve my mind. That's the telephone. Yes, I'll keep it. Well, she certainly can cook. That's more than most of them can do. Hello. Yes, sir. Boy, I'm fine. Oh, that ain't no trouble at all. She's right here. It's Mr. Steele for you, ma'am. He called you last night, but you wasn't me. Yes, Phil? Oh, I thought you idiot. You didn't bother me at all. Yes? Oh, yes. Well, drop over me. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Liz and Phil had another quarrel. I've seen it coming for quite some time. Lucy. I wonder if you'd do something for me. Oh, it's nothing, but it might be exaggerated into something. Phil is chairman of the University Committee to Help McGowan, isn't he? Yes, that's one of the things he and Liz quarreled about. She said it took up too much of his time. Well, you can see, with rumors about, like, like this, bribery and so on, it might be just as well to keep away from Phil until after the trial. You understand, don't you? Seems a little silly somehow. Appearances can be awfully important. If I sound like, uh, <laughs> One of those husbands you'll have to forgive me. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Jim. Now, Dave, the job was premeditated, and I'm pretty sure I can prove it in court. Aren't you going just a little bit out of your way, Jim? I'm not just talking as his attorney when I say that he was not in his right mind. I know, you're just talking as an old friend. Now, I've defended many a criminal, and if McAllen's won, I'm giving up the profession. Believe me, if ever a man was insane, he was. So, it's insanity again, Dave. I suppose you've got your battery of psychologists and experts all lined up. And when they get through, you have McGallan fixed up so mad, you'll be asking us to believe that it was his wife who shot him. Cigarette? No. But I tell you, the man was really crazy. It's the only possible explanation. If you keep on, none of us will be responsible for anything. We'll do what we like. We'll steal, kill anything. And if the police catch up with us, we'll just go out and hire someone as smart as you to prove it's crazy. That is, if we have the money. Now, look here, Jim. I'll give up my fee in this case if you'll play ball. Change the indictment to manslaughter with a recommendation for clemency. And we'll close the case. No, Dave. Can't do it. Not and run this job as I see it. A man who murders, regardless of the circumstances, is already a criminal at heart. Oh, forget the job this time. Gallon's a human being, and the most helpless human being I've ever come across. You ought to go over there and take a look at him. Ah, I get it now, Dave. You're just giving me the human interest. No, business. no, no, Jim. This is no trick. I tell you, McAllen is, is, is just a man like the rest of us. <laughs> a man who is madly in love with his wife and, and blind with jealousy. Why, what happened to him might have happened to any of us. Might have happened to me or to you. <laughs> Stop your kidding, Dave. <laughs> See you in court. <laughs> He looks as if you'd pin these ears back. Well, that looks fool you, Kirk. Mara's a tough and wily gentleman. We've got a fight on our hands. Got it. Will you send two dozen long scent roses to Mrs. Stowe right away? White ones. Any card? Any special sentiment? No, just for me. They're conscience flowers. Hmm. Are you sure two dozen will be enough? Two dozen will be plenty. Yes, Kirk. Mara's going to be tough. Well, I'll send his psychologists and experts screaming back to Vienna when I get through with them. Wait till I spring that confession. A kiss before the mirror. You admit, then, that you neglected your wife. You saw little of her. 
You were too busy with your humanitarian studies, your plan for a better world. I must ask you again to answer yes or no. Yes. Thank you. Did your plan for a better world include, by any chance, better consideration for your wife? I object, Your Honor. The question is here, Alvin, and then it's here. Objection sustained. The district attorney will please control his sarcasm. You are a professor of political science at the university, is that right? Yes. Your students loved you, liked your courses. I think so. You spent a great deal of your time with them, long hours after class and in the evening. Yes. And when your students were not with you, your work was with you, night and day. Is that not right, Dr. McAllen? Yes. How long would you say, Dr. McAllen, how long was it before your wife's death? that you took her out, say, to dinner, to a party, to the theater. I object, Your Honor. The question is irrelevant. Objection overruled. The district attorney may continue. How long, Doctor? A month? Two months? Three months? About three months. This, then, is the woman you loved. This woman you did not think enough of to be a companion to in her ordinary life. This woman you left to weep her heart out in her own loneliness. This is the woman you say you love with a passion, with a madness that drove you to kill? I am dead, sir. I am dead. Order! Order! Ladies and gentlemen, let me see this. Order! You in paper, ma'am. Mac Allen collapses on the witness stand. Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. Cracked at the two-hour grill by District Attorney Stone. Hello. It's the telephone, ma'am. Who is it, Phil? It's for you, ma'am. Yes? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I'll be over as soon as I can. I didn't expect you home so early. I've had one of those days. Yes, I know. I read it in the paper. Sort of a Roman holiday, wasn't it? You shouldn't read the papers, Lucy. They're not for your pretty eyes. Jim. What's the matter, Lucy? Nothing, Jim. I, I have to go to Elizabeth's for a few minutes. I wish you didn't have to go out tonight, Lucy. I'm sorry, Jim, but I have to. I'll be back before dinner. shining up on her face. I leaned down quickly and kissed her. Instantly, the moment I kissed her, she shivered. Her flesh became goose pimply as with cold. I saw her face in the mirror looking up at me, and all this happiness was gone. On it was a look of revulsion. I was
away. Why, Jim? Hello, Elizabeth. Is Lucy here? No, Jim. Why? Is something the matter? No, I just wanted to speak to her. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Liz. It's nothing. Well, come on in, Jim. I expect to. I'm waiting for her now. No, thank you, Elizabeth. I've got to go along. I just wanted to say something to her. See you later. Four oh six Maple Drive. Yes. And I knew I'd lost forever the one thing in the world I love. It's my fault. My stupidity. My neglect. Stupid record. I should have bought some new ones. Liz said you were looking for me. What is it, Jim? Nothing. Nothing much. I guess the case is about getting on my nerves. I simply wanted to tell you that I wouldn't be at home tonight. I'm staying in town. Oh, I see. It's much better if I'm near the office. Yes, I suppose it is. The office is terribly important. I can get someone to stay with me here. Yes, I'm sure you can. See you tomorrow.
Is that you, Phil? I would like the permission of the court to request a change of the present indictment. In the form in which it was returned? In its form and in its intention. This request is quite unusual. But I beg your honor to believe it has nonetheless been most carefully considered. The jury will please retire. What's the matter with Stoll today? Can't figure it out. Unless he's got a new axe. He looks as if he's ill. I do hope nothing's happened to him. This is the only day I can come. Here's where he pulls something out of his sleeve. The state has come to the belief that the indictment of murder brought against the defendant in this case was not fairly and justly conceived. The attorney for the state has come to the belief that he acted without premeditation. If it please the court, the state recommends that this indictment of murder be amended to a charge of manslaughter. This is a serious recommendation. May the court ask what consideration led the attorney for the state so to change his conviction? An unusual consideration. Since the adjournment of court yesterday, he has had experience with a case that, to a great extent, parallels this. In fact, is extraordinarily similar to it. And his findings in that case have urged him to reconsider this. He realizes, especially in view of rumors that have been afoot, the grave charges he leaves himself open to in making this recommendation, but, but he implores the court to believe but there are unimaginable moments when a man, a poor, weak man, jealous, blind, frantic, may kill the one he loves more than anyone, more than anything on earth, may kill her by some strange, tragic perversity, and in killing her, condemn himself to a life of sorrow and regret. And that, not death, is his punishment. And believe him, Your Honor, it can be a terrible one. I see. I see. Please have the jury return. The Mac Allen murder trial was startled into an uproar today by District Attorney Stowell. In a scene of unprecedented excitement, the Mac Allen trial came to an abrupt and dramatic close today. District Attorney Stowell asked the court that the first degree murder charge be withdrawn. Well, it looks as if you're finally getting away on that trip, Mrs. Stowell. Something like that, Jack. Miss Stowell! Miss Stowell, you should hear Miss 
Stowell. Mr. Stowell. Mr. Stowell just let that McAllen man go. He let him go? Yeah, something like that. You just come on in and listen, Mr. Stowell. Surprise the spectators and the court by asking that the first degree murder charge be dismissed. The jury, following Judge Forbes' instructions, immediately returned a verdict of manslaughter with a recommendation for clemency. The penalty calls for from 10 to 20 years. District Attorney Stowell has blankly refused all further discussion of the case. We will now continue with our regular program. I thought sure they were going to electrify him. Thank you, Creola. I learned a lot just sitting here on my day off, improving my mind. I saw drinks outside. I know it's too late for regrets, you see. I've been mad. Mad. There's no other word for it. No other explanation of my selfishness and stupidity. You've always been generous, Lucy. And before you go, I'm going to ask you one last great kindness. Won't you let me start all over again? Not here in this house. Not as your husband. Not even as an old friend, but just as if we'd only met. Strangers, meeting for the first time. Like that first snowy day in New Haven. And let me try to win you, to win you back. I don't know, Gemma. When you walked out last night, it, it seemed that your job, the prosecutor had won. Believe me, Lucy, I didn't know. I didn't realize what had happened between us until yesterday when I saw you sitting before the mirror. When you kissed me? Yes, when I came home. I hated you then. I just read your cross-examination of McAllen and how he collapsed on the witness stand. And you seemed to be more of a, an executioner than an attorney. I know. I understand, Lucy. And afterwards, when you left the room, I realize the truth for the first time. Hello, folks. I want you all to meet the young lady's husband. We were married before breakfast. Oh, Liz, I'm so happy. I don't know what I'm crying for. Come here, bride. Kiss Mr. Stoll. After all, it was his wife that did it. That's right, Jim. He was really going to run out. Don't I know? When I was over there last night, he had his bags all packed. My bag, you mean. All the happiness <laughs> in the world, Elizabeth. Thanks, Jim. I don't have to wish you happiness, Phil. You have it. Thank you, Jim. I hate to admit it in front of two women, but I think you're right. Thank you, sir. Well, Jim, isn't there a bottle of wine on ice? Not now, Jim. Save it until we get back. Come on, Victor. We've got to run. On to Niagara Falls. To Niagara Falls? Phil insists. He wants to be different. We're going to drive up in the flipper, and I tie the tin can and ribbons out all by myself. And he's made one of those just marriage signs, too. Did not read somewhere about the bridge over the falls being done? Oh, we can still send postcards. That was a marvelous thing you did today. You're a great man, Jim. Hardly. I just came to my senses, that's all, Phil. Well, come on, Liz, we've got to be moving. Well, goodbye, Phil. Goodbye, Jim. Goodbye, goodbye Lucy. Goodbye. Good luck. Thanks again, darling. Forget it. Ring us up when you get back. <laughs> come on, Mama, we've got to go. Don't call me Mama. I don't like it. Oh, you better get used to it. Oh. Hello. It's the telephone, Mr. Stowell. Who is it, Creola? It's that Mr. Allison from the office, and he said it was most urgent. No, Dan. Well, I've had enough of the job. Enough for a while, anyway. That's right. No, I won't do it. No, I'm not resigning, Dan. The job's all right. <laughs> the trouble's with me. I've just got wise to myself. But, Jim, the newspaper boys are packed outside, and there's some pretty nasty talk going around. Yes, bribery. The McAllen millions, you know what I mean. Let them talk. Let them investigate. Let them do what they like. I'll take care of them all when I get back. Let me talk to uh, Sharpie. Yes, Mr. Stowell. With the greatest of pleasure. That's my little good deed for the day. Never mind that, Jake. Please bring the other man back. I won't be going for a few days. Yes, ma'am. At first, I couldn't believe my ears. 
Someday, darling, I'll tell you a story and you won't believe your ears. About us? About me. About my great reformation. It happened last night. Tell me. I'll tell you on the boat for Europe, darling. <laughs>